Hello, and welcome to I Know Dino, the, the Big, Big Dinosaur, Dinosaur Podcast, Podcast, where we cover news, interviews, and discussions of all things dinosaur. Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today's podcast is brought to you by TRX Dinosaurs. They have innovative puppets, posable sculptures, as well as animatronics. And you can find out more at trxdinosaurs.com. And by the Royal Tyrrell Museum. Every year they host experts from around the world to present the latest research happening in the field of paleontology. You can get more information at tyrrellmuseum.com and view previous speakers on YouTube. This week we have Dinosaur of the Day Glacialsaurus, and we have a bunch of dinosaur news. As always, this week we would like to thank some of our Stegosaurus patrons, and this week that includes Lucas and Eli, Wyatt, the Georges family, John Heck, Janice, Ranger Chris from Dino for Hire, and Ray. Thank you so much to all of our patrons. We really appreciate you. And to thank you and to welcome any new patrons if you are considering pledging from now until Valentine's Day, February 14th. If you are our patron by then, then we will be giving you a special Valentine's Day premium audio content. These are our quote unquote love stories from our top 10 dinosaur series. Yes, although not very loving. So don't get your hopes up. (laughs) And this episode is airing on Valentine's Day, so you have a few hours left. It's not too late. Check out our page at patreon.com slash I know dino. And if you sign up before the next episode comes out, then we'll be nice and give it to you too. (laughs) Because love. And we're generous like that. (laughs) Jumping right into the news... We have a new article that was written by Jessica Mitchell and others and published in Paleobiology, and it's all about how we can date dinosaur bones with maybe a new-ish technique. So (laughs) previously we've talked about lags or lines of arrested growth, and it's kind of like counting tree rings. It's a pretty simple analogy. Older bones have more rings, so you count up the rings and you can see how old the dinosaur is potentially. Unless it's a sauropod. Exactly. Or if they're too old, a lot of times they get hollow in the middle, which destroys the early years. The dinosaur's hiding its age. (laughs) Yeah, pretty much. (laughs) The hollowness actually isn't as big of a problem as the outer edge because you can kind of approximate the early years a little bit, but it's really hard to see the outer edges because the lines start to overlap because obviously as the dinosaurs get older, they start to grow really slowly, if at all. And then, like Sabrina says, sometimes they don't even have lags. You can also look at the histological ontogenetic stages, or HOS, and I'm pretty sure this is that spongy versus compact bone thing that Jack Horner's TED Talk is all about when he talks about where are all the baby dinosaurs. Hmm. And basically the idea is when animals are growing, they have this spongier bone tissue because it's growing rapidly, and then over time, it kind of hardens into more compact bone. So if you slice out little pieces of it, you can check for how spongy it is and then get kind of an indicator for how old it might be. But really that's more of an indication of if it's fully developed and not a specific age, it's not very useful for counting quantitative ages. The new technique that this paper is all about focuses on a different feature of osteons And they call them remodeling stages, or RS, because everything needs an abbreviation when they're in bones, apparently. Rolls off the tongue better. (laughs) I guess so. So osteons, I had to look this up because I'm not a bone expert, are basically these compact bone units that form a sort of tube around blood vessels. And they're less than a millimeter in diameter and only about a few millimeters long. So you can imagine a bone composed of thousands and thousands of these little tiny compact bone pieces that are encasing little blood vessels because your bones need blood too. Interestingly, you can look at the arrangement of these osteons and sometimes you can determine the species from it because it varies across different species. And you can also tell which bone that they're in, in some cases, because different bones in the same species will have different arrangements of osteons. So it's not really a super simple feature, (laughs) because obviously there's a lot of complexity that's added to it. But luckily, they are present in most mammals and dinosaurs. 
which is useful if you're trying to use them to do some science. (laughs) (laughs) This technique of looking at the remodeling stages is really only new to paleontology. Archaeologists have been using it for quite a while, and according to phys.org, it's how they determined the Iceman Oatsy was about 45 years old when he died because they looked at his osteons. Oh, so young. I don't know. That's not that young for a 10,000 or 5,000 year old caveman. I know. I was thinking of it in modern terms. Oh, yeah, I suppose. But they didn't have any dentistry or anything back then. So really is probably happy. (laughs) So with this RS, essentially, they're looking at the osteons in older bones where the osteons have replaced the younger osteons. And Jessica Mitchell told phys.org, quote, this reconstruction process is continually taking place within us and ensures that we have a new skeleton more or less every 10 years, end quote. Fascinating, because you don't think about your bones (laughs) really doing anything, but it turns out they're constantly replacing the cells within themselves so that Isn't that all cells in general? Yeah, that is, yeah. So, and... Maybe I heard, I read somewhere it's about seven years for I forget how many cells in your body, and so hmm. you're kind of like a whole new person <laughs> <That's> <laughs> every seven to ten years. <laughs> yeah, it's weird to think about, but yeah, even your bones are included in that. I guess they're maybe they're at the longer end of the spectrum in terms of replacement time because like red blood cells, I think, are only around for a month or so. Mm. But I, yeah, I have no idea. I'm not at all qualified to answer. But no. Yeah, <laughs> it was really a rhetorical question. Uh, okay. <laughs> So what the paleontologists can do is they can slice out these pieces from bones and they picked 79 sauropod bones because as Sabrina mentioned, they're one of the ones where you can't get lags easily. So Those it'd be darn sauropods. Especially useful. Yeah. <laughs> Although really it might be useful to do this in one that did have lags because you might be able to compare the two and come up with a better correlation for age. Mm. But in any event, they tried to see if they could figure out the number of osteon generations that they could see in the sauropod bones. They did find a positive correlation between the generations of osteons and the bone length in six of the eight species that they looked at. And basically, they assumed that bigger bones, therefore longer bones, would be older dinosaurs. Had more time to grow. Exactly. Exactly. And so you'd expect to see more of these osteon generations. But it's kind of weird that it didn't work in two of the eight species that they looked at. So obviously it wasn't precise enough to estimate specific ages. And they need to do some more work on this to get it nailed down. They suggested that they might be able to use some modern relatives in order to kind of piece together how exactly these osteons change and what different generations of osteons look like over time. So maybe cutting into some crocodile bones or some bird bones might help. I mean, it's interesting that we have them too. (laughs) I mean, (laughs) potentially, maybe you could even use human bone, but we're not as close of a relative, so it might not be as useful. One of the coolest things that I found in this osteon rabbit hole is that in archaeology, sometimes they can use the type of osteons and their arrangement to determine the gender of a human. Ooh. Yeah. So maybe... So you could apply that to a dinosaur. Exactly. I don't know, though. It's a pretty random (laughs) connection that I'm trying to make here. Well, I was thinking if you start with the medullary bone of the T-Rex where you know that one was pregnant and therefore female. Yeah, that's there's a way to do. I don't know if they're certain about that, but that's a good point. If you could find some other indicator or maybe one that was like sitting on a nest or where there was like an egg inside, because every once in a while they find one where it looks like the egg might have been in the dinosaur, Mm -hmm. then you could crack that Rosetta Stone. Yep, (laughs) exactly. Next up is an article from Science Advances by Joseph Burns and Leif Karlstrom, and this one was looking at a really massive magma outflow that was caused by the Chicxulub impact. If you're wondering how on earth we could tell (laughs) that there was a bunch of magma that got squished out by the Chicxulub impact, they found it by measuring gravity anomalies around the oceans. So that sounds really weird when you talk about gravity anomalies, but 
the way they phrased it in the paper was concentrated positive free air gravity, which is even more confusing. <laughs> Basically, what that is is a corrected value for how much the Earth is pulling relative to what a perfectly smoothed Earth would pull. And in this case, what that means is if there's a mountain underwater, it pulls a little bit more than if it's a smooth seabed down where you would expect the seabed to be. And the scientists said that this was really the only technique they could use to try to detect this sort of worldwide topography of ocean depth because it would take, I think they said, like a century <laughs> to get in boats and use sonar to map out all this ocean floor. But luckily, NASA and German Aerospace Center launched a project about 15 years ago where they put a couple satellites in orbit and they measured the gravity all over the Earth to do this sort of rough estimates of topography all over the place, including all the oceans. So they could use that data to see exactly where the ocean crust is a little bit thicker. If you're familiar with the way that plate tectonics work, most of the new crust comes from the middle of the oceans. Basically what happens is there are these big cracks in the Pacific and Atlantic and other oceans, and the crust spreads away from these basically underwater volcanoes, which they call mid-ocean ridges, and they do so pretty evenly over time. So the scientists can look at that creeping rate and estimate an area that's about 66 million years old and see from distance to this mid-ocean ridge, and they probably have a few samples from cores to just confirm this with radioactive decay and things like that. So they can estimate at this point, which looks like it's about 66 million years of creep away from that mid-ocean ridge, just how thick the ocean floor is relative to the ocean floor near it. And what they found was that at that Chicxulub impact point, when all the dinosaurs went extinct, there was a huge spike in the amount of seafloor that you saw there. Another way of phrasing that is when the Chicxulub impactor hit, it squeezed out a bunch of magma <laughs> out of the earth. When they estimated how much magma got squeezed out, they said that it was between 10 to the 5th and 10 to the 6th cubic kilometers which I have no idea how to express, so I went down a rabbit hole. <laughs> of, Everything sends you down a rabbit it hole. It really does, all the science-y stuff. But this time, I decided to see how many times that would fill the entire San Francisco Bay. And for my purposes, I define the San Francisco Bay as a little bit past the Golden Gate, all the way down to San Jose at the southern tip of the San Francisco Bay and all the way east to Stockton. So it includes the San Pablo Bay and all the estuary and everything like that. And guess how many times it would fill it? A lot? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> You're correct. Since they gave that range of 10 to the 5th to 10 to the 6th, it's between 100,000 times and a million times. So if you imagine the entire San Francisco Bay is filled with magma, or lava, you know, the red, molten, nasty stuff. Mm -hmm. And then that happens 100,000 times. Oh my God. <laughs> That's how much magma <laughs> was out, getting squeezed out by the Chicxulub impact. They no think. wonder there was an extinction event. Yeah, there's a crazy amount of magma. They say that they think it's similar to the amount that was added at the eruptions at the Deccan Traps, which we've talked about before. Those are the volcanoes that erupted in modern-day India. So when you combine the Deccan Traps, this extra mid-ocean magma, and the Chicxulub impact, and you know, now we're up to three really gnarly things <laughs> going on <laughs> at once. It's amazing anything survived. Yeah. So I have a little bit of speculation about this. I think that these oceanic eruptions probably wouldn't have directly affected dinosaurs all that much because... I don't think, since they're underwater, they would have been spewing sulfur into the upper atmosphere and potentially cooling things down or making acid rain or anything like that. But I do think there's a potential for it changing the chemistry of the oceans, which might have killed off a lot of the marine life, which previously we had kind of wondered about, like, why did these marine things go extinct? But if there was a little bit of an anoxic event, 
which you might get from something like a whole bunch of sulfuric acid forming in the oceans or some other offshoot from all this magma. Then you could have a lot of fish dying and you could have dinosaurs that relied on eating fish dying out as well. And then you also just generally can start to have an ecosystem collapse whenever the ocean goes down. It's such a huge part of Earth's ecosystem that it can cause all sorts of problems. So maybe that's partly why all these marine reptiles went extinct. That's always a big question. And speaking of NASA, there's a new article in Nature Scientific Reports by Ray Stanford and others, and it's all about footprints that were uncovered near NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. Yeah, all the headlines were something like, dinosaurs found in NASA's backyard. <laughs> yeah, and... In this case, NASA's backyard is near Washington, D.C. in Maryland. And luckily, they stumbled onto these dinosaur tracks before the area was ripped up for a new office building, which was planned to happen. The trackway was really small, and so they could actually just excavate the whole thing. It's not like some of these big sauropod trackways we talk about that are, you know, hundreds of feet long. This one was only about two square meters or about 20 square feet total. Mm. So I think it was less than nine feet long. So it's won't slow down that office building then. Nope. <laughs> but even though it was so small, it still had a lot of tracks in it. It had about 70 tracks, in fact, which is a crazy number, including a sauropod print, an adult notosaur print, several notosaur baby prints, several sets of theropod tracks pterosaur prints and a pterosaur beak mark <laughs> potentially one possible crocodilian print and a whole bunch of mammalian prints in fact it's the second largest number of mammalian prints in any mesozoic trackway ever found so all the mammalian people got really excited about this trackway even more than the dinosaur people <laughs> <laughs> One of the mammalian prints is really interesting because the lead author, Stanford, thinks that some of them look like a squirrel sitting in a way like you would expect a modern squirrel to sit while it's eating a nut. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of got its feet parallel and it looked like it was moving relatively slowly. And that print actually got a new ichnotaxa named after it. So basically a new species based on the print itself. And they call it Sideroripes. Goddardensis, which sedere is Latin for to be in a sitting position. <laughs> so that makes sense. And then obviously Goddard is for the NASA site. In this big fossilized slab, it isn't just dinosaur tracks and mammal tracks and potentially pterosaur tracks and beak mark. They also found coprolite or fossilized poop. They don't know which one might have pooped it though. <laughs> as well as an invertebrate fossil that looks like a worm or a larva, and possibly a notosaur osteoderm, which I thought was pretty weird because none of the other stuff was from a dead animal. But are, are notosaurs just popping off osteoderms while they're walking around? That seems really <laughs> weird. <laughs> Maybe something bit it off. Yeah, I guess that could be. There wasn't, I mean, unless it was the sauropod or, or something, <laughs> there wasn't anything in the trackway that would have messed with it. All the, I didn't mention it, but the notosaur and the sauropod tracks are both obviously pretty large, but all the other tracks, the mammalian and the theropod tracks, are way smaller. So they're basically the size of like a, big bird like maybe a seagull sized animal or something maybe even smaller i don't know pretty small dinosaurs wouldn't expect to be messing with a notosaur but you know this is only a 20 square foot area so maybe there's something off to the side chomping on it <laughs> i don't know and that possible osteoderm was at the very edge so maybe there's some huge predator right off the edge chomping at it i don't know one of the really cool things about it is that none of the tracks overlap which they think might mean that they were all laid down right around the same time because maybe they were avoiding one another or avoiding each other's tracks. And they also propose that it might show that dinosaurs were hunting the mammals. Hmm. That's because the multiple theropod tracks are roughly parallel. They do kind of lead towards each other in a way a little bit, but they're going in the same direction as the mammal. So maybe these were theropods hunting that mammal. Interesting. Yeah. 
With a pterosaur, it could be that it snatched something out of the ground with its beak and then pushed off to fly away because the print looks like it might be a pushing off print. Also really interesting. The preservation of all the fossils is also really amazing. They almost look fake. You can clearly see all of the digits in most cases. And when I was looking at it, I thought that it was all highlighted for my convenience. <laughs> so I, I took a closer look, and I think that's actually the way that most of the tracks were preserved. Maybe some of them were prepared out a little bit so that you could see a little bit more of the track than may have been initially obvious, but they're really cool looking. They think that they were preserved so well because... It was in a riverbed, and riverbeds can often be quickly buried. So maybe that's what happened in this case, that they all, all these dinosaurs and mammals and pterosaurs and crocodile and everything <laughs> were walking around right around the same time, and then it quickly got buried right after they were out of the area. They also mentioned in one of the articles about this that they used radar to look for other sandstone underground in the area because they were planning on making this big commercial building. But when they dug up the other stuff, they didn't find anything notable. Well, that's kind of cool that they could poke around underground Jurassic Park style yeah. <laughs> looking for other fossils. Apparently, they put a replica of the fossil in Goddard's Earth Science Building, but I'm not sure about the public access to that, if you can just walk in and see it, or if you have to be like a NASA employee or something. I think they said it was in the atrium, so maybe you could just go in and look at it and then leave before they get upset with you for being somewhere you shouldn't be. I don't know. <laughs> hmm. Don't take our word on that. <laughs> we have no idea. I don't know, yeah. <laughs> Before we get into the rest of the news, we want to pause for a word from the Royal Tyrrell Museum. Their annual speaker series brings world-renowned scientists and researchers to the museum and offers them a platform to discuss hot topics in paleontology and to share the results of their current research with the public. And they're the only museum in Canada dedicated exclusively to the science of paleontology. Generally, these presentations are on Thursdays at 11 a.m. in the museum auditorium, between January and April, but the next one is on Friday, February 16th. There are a couple, I think, that are on Fridays, and the one on Friday the 16th is going to be all about paleontology of the Cretaceous chalk. Ooh. Yeah. So I had to look up what Cretaceous chalk was because I had never heard of it, but I really should have. It's a marine formation from southern and eastern England, and it includes the Seven Sisters and the White Cliffs of Dover in Britain and the Needles on the Isle of Wight, which are all very famous and obvious <laughs> geological <laughs> formations that you'd expect someone like me to know about. <laughs> well, now you know. Yeah, I'm going to definitely have to watch this talk because even though I can't make it to the Royal Tyrrell Museum, they do post all of the talks on YouTube after the fact. So if you can't make it, you can go to YouTube and check them out. And you can also check out previous year's speakers. Yep. Because they have a whole playlist. Looks like 86 videos as of this recording. I think they're all between maybe a half hour and an hour long. And the format is really great. It reminds me of SVP a little bit, where you've got the expert kind of either presenting their research or um, one of them was talking about some of the community aspects involved. So very cool. There's a lot of really exciting dinosaur paleontologists coming up later, too, that we're going to talk about, but leave you guessing a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Although, if you want to get ahead and see who else is going to be on in their speaker series, you can head over to TyrrellMuseum.com, and if you don't know how to spell that, I would just grab it from our show notes, which you can get either on our website or attached to this in whichever way you're listening to this right now. <laughs> Back to the news. A new dinosaur has been found in Las Vegas, in Nevada. It's not yet described or named, but it is being studied at the Las Vegas Natural History Museum by Dr. Josh Bond. And right now he's thinking it's a hadrosaur that lived about 100 million years ago. Once it's named, it'll, well, I guess it already is. It's the first unique dinosaur found in Nevada. Ooh. And the bones were found by accident by students back in 2008. Cool. Mm-hmm. So they're already kind of spilling the beans that they think it's a new species. Yeah, but not too many details yet. In Japan, in Sasayam, Hyogo Prefecture, 
three ceratopsians from the Cretaceous have been found, and the ages are all different, which could provide some good insights. They found 16 bones, including the jaws, so that's what's exciting is these cranial bones. Yeah, a lot of times with ceratopsians, you just get that big old frill and maybe some horns. It's nice to get a little something extra once in a while. (laughs) Especially at different ages. Yeah. In Virginia, the Virginia Museum of Natural History just got a grant that will allow it to digitally catalog their fossil collection so that anyone can access it. That means me. (laughs) There you go. (laughs) Just for you, Garrett. (laughs) There are about 5,000 fossil specimens. They have a lot of the collection already available on the website, it sounds like, but getting it digitized is going to help out a lot of researchers. And me. And you, yes. (laughs) (laughs) and if the virginia museum of natural history sounds familiar to you that is where dr alex hastings is from and he was our interviewee in our previous episode so congrats all next we've got kind of a trend of naming state dinosaurs because he talked about what's going on in utah and now in arizona 11 year old jacks weldon's pushing to get a state dinosaur for his home state (laughs) And he reached out to Governor Doug Ducey, who found a sponsor for the bill, Senator Brophy McGee. But I couldn't find any information on which dinosaur. Maybe they haven't decided or gotten that far yet. There are a lot of good dinosaur discoveries from Arizona, though, so that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I wonder which one they would do. Hmm. (laughs) (laughs) Could you see the thought bubble? Yeah. (laughs) Also in Idaho, a local paleontologist is trying to get an official state dinosaur. Dr. L.J. Krumenacher wants it to be Arictodromius, which is a burrowing dinosaur. And we talked about this dinosaur with Anthony J. Martin in one of our early, early episodes. And that's a common dinosaur found in Idaho. Uh, His hope is to have a state dinosaur so that it's easier to educate kids about dinosaurs from Idaho and get them excited. Yeah. Arictodromius is awesome, too, because mm-hmm. that was the first one to show that dinosaurs burrowed. Yeah. Because it actually got found in its burrow, which is just awesome. Mm-hmm. Up next, we've got some Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom news. And spoiler alert, we're going to go into a lot of depth in the trailer. So if you don't want to hear about what goes on in the movie, which you can see from the trailer and other hints around the web, then you should skip this part. The second trailer was released during the Super Bowl in the U.S. A lot of you, I'm sure, have already seen it. It's about a minute and a half long, and I think it's darker than the first one. What do you think, Garrett? Yeah. I mean, it's always hard to tell from the trailers, because I think every trailer for all, what is this, the fifth now in the series, they have that kind of horror movie slant to them, Mm -hmm. even though... The movies themselves kind of have different levels of horror-ness to them. (laughs) But this one, the way it starts off with those giant dinosaur-like claws that are reaching out to a little girl in her bed, and she's trying to inch away, that's pretty intense. And I think that's the new Indoraptor, or whatever they're going to call that dinosaur. Yeah, I wonder if that's the one that people keep thinking is Baryonyx. I'm not sure. No, the Baryonyx was later in the trailer. Okay. And we saw that one in the first trailer, too. It seems so big for a Baryonyx, but I guess I shouldn't be surprised considering it's Jurassic Park and that's well, what they do. It, it, the hands seemed unrealistic to me, too. Yeah. But... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they're really just assuming there are huge keratinous sheaths over the claws. <laughs> I guess, <laughs> Which yeah. we can't prove weren't there. <laughs> <laughs> True. And in the trailer, we also see more of Owen Grady's relationship with Blue, which I think was expected. There's this all really dramatic scene. It's only a couple seconds where it shows Owen barely escaping the jaws of a T-Rex. Hmm, yeah. Quite the stunt. <laughs> and lots of dinosaur fights, of course. There's also now a Dinosaur Protection Group website officially out that is, quote, dedicated to establishing and protecting the rights of all living dinosaurs. And that one, it says, was launched by Claire Deering. The website also has more information about the movie, and it talks about cloning dinosaurs since 1986, and it mentions that some species have started to go extinct. And there's a section about volcano watching, so they're dropping some hints here. Yeah, in case nobody knew about the volcano. Yeah. Well, the cloning since 1986 is interesting, too. And that they refer to it as going extinct, because technically they already are extinct. You know, like if you create... Even the ones that they created. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know how you define that. yeah. 
if you create like if you created a hybrid like a pluot you know that combination of a plum and an apricot or whatever it is mm-hmm. and then you stop cultivating any of those did that mean pluots went extinct maybe mm, not an expert here <laughs> <laughs> In Jurassic Park news, in honor of the 25-year anniversary, there's a new dinosaur collectible. It's from Chronicle Collectibles, and it's the Sick Triceratops. It's a Hmm. diorama. And it looks really great, but kind of sad because, you know, Sick Triceratops. It costs $449 and is a limited edition. Yeah, that's about average for a Chronicle Collectibles. They're the ones that had like the $1,000 bust of a T-Rex and things like that. Mm Mm-hmm. What would be fun to do is have like a little G.I. Joe for us like Steven Spielberg to sit in front of it. <laughs> so it looks like he's hunting it like that, <laughs> that oh, picture no. that went viral. Then you can recreate it. Yeah. And take a picture of it. And then people will be like, why'd that mean G.I. Joe hunt that Triceratops? <laughs> <laughs> in Sasebo, Nagasaki Prefecture in Japan, there's going to be a new theme park attraction that uses augmented reality. And it's called Jurassic Island. It opens April 28th. And on the island, you can battle dinosaurs in an outdoor setting. The venue is about six kilometers away from the main park. And you wear AR goggles and you walk around, fight off dinosaurs. That sounds awesome. Mm -hmm. I want to do that. We need to go there. (laughs) (laughs) Next, thanks to Madzilla, who shared this with us via Facebook. So he has been working on... Mizzou Toys for a while now, and his site sells unique Pinewood collectibles. There's a cool Brachiosaurus, T-Rex, Stegosaurus, and more. It's really pretty, and it blends in well with books. There's pictures of it with books, in addition to just being cool toys. Nice. Mm -hmm. Last in the news, Makezine shared a do-it-yourself project where you can create a wooden Stegosaurus that holds memory cards. (laughs) So in the video, there's a woman who's cutting the wood with a handsaw and then sanding it down. And it can also be modified to hold keys or USB sticks. It's pretty cool and pretty cute. I was just thinking, I bet you could 3D print that too. Yeah, probably. Before we get into our next section, I just want to thank our listeners. I think at least in a few episodes, I've mentioned the lack of dinosaur clothing for adults. and Especially adult women. Yes, And there have been some amazing listeners who've really taken that to heart. And I've gotten some really awesome clothing recommendations. And also, I just want to shout out to our patron Janice because she made me a dinosaur skirt with pockets. It's awesome. It is. (laughs) And she made me a bow tie, too. Yeah, we posted a picture of it on our Instagram if you want to check it out. But I don't know how to tie a bow tie. So don't get your hopes up about seeing a bow tie neatly tied. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, we looked it up and we failed. (laughs) But still really cool. So thank you all. It's amazing that you've shared this with us. And especially thank you to Janice. Before we get into our dinosaur of the day, we have another word from TRX Dinosaurs. TRX Dinosaurs makes innovative puppets and posable sculptures and animatronics and also posts some really awesome work in progress photos and videos on Instagram at TRX Dinosaurs. So this latest one is a work in progress of Velociraptor. So it looks really realistic. You can't tell at all from this picture that it's made out of foam. Yeah, it looks really cool. And he's obviously giving a lot of extra detail to these feathers by using different colors of paint. So it's kind of a brownish color, but there's lots of different shades of brown all around it to give it a more realistic appearance. And they also make them in brown and black and other shades too. So since everything is custom order, I'm guessing that whoever ordered this one wanted it to be this really interesting brown pattern. Reminds me of an owl. Yeah, it does kind of look owly. But if you would like to get your own custom dinosaur, sculpture or puppet or animatronic then head over to trxdinosaurs.com and tell them exactly what you would like and they will work with you to make your very own dinosaur and now on to our dinosaur of the day glacialosaurus which was a request from jessica via patreon so thank you 
It's a mesospondylid sauropodomorph that lived in the Jurassic in what is now Antarctica, and the fossils were found in the 1990s by Dr. William R. Hammer of Augustana College and a team. It was found in the lower part of the Hansen Formation in Mount Kirkpatrick, and the fossils were found at an elevation of more than 13,000 feet, or about 4,100 meters. Oof. Yeah, and they had to remove the bones from ice and rock using jackhammers, rock saws, and chisels. So more difficult than usual, I would say. Yeah. <laughs> it's known from a partial foot and referred material of a left femur. And it was described in 2007 by Nathan Smith and Diego Pohl. The type species is Glacialosaurus hammeri, and the name means icy lizard or frozen lizard, and refers to the Beardmore Glacier region in the central Transantarctic Mountains where the fossils were found. And the species name is in honor of William Hammer. It's the first sauropodomorph found in Antarctica, and it shows how early sauropods and sauropodomorphs were distributed. They've been found in China, South Africa, South America, North America, Antarctica, and this is probably due to connections between continents at the time. Other sauropod fossils have been found in the same formation, which shows that early sauropods and sauropodomorphs coexisted together for a while. Glacialosaurus was herbivorous, and it was estimated to be 20 to 25 feet long, or 6 to 8 meters, and weigh 4 to 6 tons. Predators at the time included Cryolophosaurus, so would have probably had to watch out for that. And Glacialosaurus's foot is similar to Lefungosaurus, which lived in the early Jurassic in China. So it's possible they were close relatives. I love good Antarctic dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. It's just amazing that we can find anything there. <laughs> and our fun fact of the day is that birds evolved from dinosaurs, but not the last dinosaurs, like T-Rex. A lot of people, when they think about the history of life on Earth, think of it in a very chronological fashion. But really, the tree of life is much more tree-shaped. You know, the, there are different branches that can take a long time before one overtakes another. So really, birds were already well-established before the KPG mass extinction. And of course, that's how they survived the mass extinction. It wasn't like... T-Rex went extinct and then out of the mud popped a bird. <laughs> <laughs> there were lots of birds around in the Cretaceous already, and even some in the Jurassic, depending on how you define it. And this is similar to the common flawed arguments about how, like, if people evolved from monkeys, why are there still monkeys? Or <laughs> an alternate that I really like, if Americans came from Britain, why are there still British people? <laughs> <laughs> It's the same kind of thing with birds and dinosaurs. You can have a subgroup that splits off and starts doing its own thing while the original group remains, or in the case of dinosaurs, remains and then evolves into something completely different. So even though birds did evolve from theropods, they didn't evolve from the last theropods. They evolved from theropods that split off much earlier. So a chicken can't be evo devoed back into a T-Rex, unfortunately. It would turn into some other kind of dinosaur probably a small micro raptor type thing or something cool and that wraps up this episode of i know dino thanks for listening don't forget you have a few hours left to sign up to be our patron if you're not already and we will thank you with premium audio content the love stories from our top 10 dinosaur series also don't forget to subscribe to our podcast so you don't miss out on any episodes thanks again for listening and until next time Thank you for listening to I Know Dino. If you have any questions or comments about dinosaurs, we'd like to hear from you at plesiosaur at iknowdino.com. And for more information on dinosaurs, go to iknowdino.com or follow us on Google, Facebook, Tumblr, or Twitter at iknowdino.